Amen. All right, Matthew, Matthew chapter 6. You say, wait, didn't we just preach out of that this morning? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Uh, where's my place here? Matthew 6, Matthew 6, verse 19. Matthew 6, verse 19. Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. He says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now, quick rundown. Um, uh, we're instructed to lay up Bible, or in the Bible, to lay up treasures in heaven, which tells me two things from this. I can lay up eternal, or I can lay up temporal. I can lay up heavenly, or I can lay up earthly treasures. Now, what is a treasure? A treasure is something that we find as valuable. A treasure is something that is valuable. I've had all kinds of valuables destroyed, destroyed, or they wear away, or they break, or they've been stolen. Um, uh, uh, so, so they're valuable, whether they're sentimental, or they have actual real intrinsic value, or you take it to, you know, antique road show or something, and they say, hey, this is this, and this is how much it's worth, you know, and you go, wow, and, and, and wow, I can't believe it's that worth that much, and money's a great thing. I mean, come on, let's not kid ourselves. Money is a really great thing. It's a, it's a fantastic thing because it, it helps you do what you want to do and go where you want to go and have what you want to have. I like money. I, I don't know about you, but I really, I don't love it, but I really like it. Like I'm, I'm its next door neighbor to love. You know, I just, I love, I like money. Now the love of money is the root of all evil. That greed, you know, the love of money, riches, value, um, but once we get a, a, man, a relationship with Jesus, we start walking with Jesus and talking with Jesus and listening to the preacher and, and get involved in a ministry and the Bible begins to open itself up to us and, and understanding, God lends us to us understanding, we finally come to the realization that God may not think the things, God may not think that the things we think are valuable are valuable. So we say, okay, God, what? What's valuable? Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. He didn't say don't lay up treasures. He didn't say be broke. He didn't say be poor. He said lay up treasure in heaven. Okay. Would he tell me to do something that he would not tell me how to do? Would he tell me to do something and had no intention on putting any information on how to do that? No, of course he wouldn't. Um, uh, so lay up treasure in heaven, lay up treasure in heaven. Well, we have to first realize that God is the appraiser of all things. God is the appraiser of all things. He determines what's valuable. God says, this is what's valuable and this is not valuable. This is valuable and this isn't valuable. Um, uh, the, uh, so God is the appraiser and the Bible is the appraisal book. The Bible is is the appraisal book. The word of God appraises everything in life, absolutely everything. And the pinnacle, the pinnacle appraisal in the Bible, of course, is the value of a soul. The value of a soul. There, are, there is no book in the world authored and written and composed by man that can tell you what the value of a soul is. Um, in our society, people are, are throw. It's really, it's really quite sad. Uh, uh, but um, it's we have so many throwaway people. We have so many deplorables. We have so many people who are just. I, I don't, I don't know what the statistics are, but right now, somebody passed away. Right now, somebody passed away. Right now, somebody passed away. But guess what's happening? I'm still here. I'm still teaching. You're sitting there. You're still listening. I hope uh, the world is still spinning. The sun is setting. The world is still spinning on its axis. The stars will shine tonight. The moon will come out and the sun will go make its revolution and come back around. But the world keeps on turning. See, the world 
Not only does the world not know what the value of a soul is, we don't even know how to handle it. We just got to keep on keeping on. But this value of a soul, here's the value of a soul. Do you know what the value of a soul is? The blood of Jesus Christ. That's the value of a soul. For God so loved the world, let's put it this way. For God so loved the world that in order to save mankind, he had to give his only begotten son. In order for mankind to be saved, Jesus Christ had to die. No one else could do it. Not Gabriel, not Michael, not Lucifer, not some other high archangel or outstanding angel in, in, in God's um, uh, angelic band, angelic army. Nobody, not the Pope, not the Dalai Lama, not Mother Teresa, not, um, uh, not Buddha, not Muhammad, not Joseph Smith, nobody, nobody can save you. And here, not only nobody, but not even you can save you. Many people venture out to say, well, I can save me. I'm in deep water, I can swim out. I'm lost in the woods, I know north, east, south, west, I can get out. Okay, well, you're in a, you're in a jungle of sin and you're not getting out. You are in an ocean of sin and you can't swim your way out of it. That's called works. You cannot work your way out of it if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. If you haven't put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ alone, alone, then you're on your way to hell. You say, you say that so abrasively. No, I say it so as a matter of factly. It's a fact. Jack, and if your name is Jack and you see this, I don't mean to offend you. Uh, but um, uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's a fact. It's a fact, Jill. It's a fact that if you die without Christ, you go to hell. But God is not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. The repentance is of not any of those guys or any of those people or any of those works or any of those ways, but Jesus Christ alone. So that's the value of a soul. The value of a soul is that Jesus, the Son of God, had to die to purchase it. Now, the world doesn't appraise the soul the same value that Jesus does. The Bible says in Romans 5, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Like hardly at all will one lay their life on the line for a righteous man. <laughs> Yet peradventure, or saying like not even close, peradventure, like you think, you think somebody's gonna die for the unrighteous? They hardly even die for the righteous. So here's what scripture says. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. That just means goes, would I lay my life on the line for you? Mm. Ah. But here it finishes off in verse number eight. But God commendeth his love toward us. The bad ones, the sinful ones the deplorable ones, but God commendeth or showed his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While you were a bad man, why were you, while, while you were a swearing, cussing, gang banging, tattoo wearing, smoking, drinking, fighting, filthy thinking, filthy talking, just a, 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 just a, a, a low grade human being, a pig in its wallowing in the mud, eating its slop, Christ died for us. Yet for a good man, one will scarcely die. For a righteous man, one will scarcely die. Peradventure for a good man, will one dare to die? But Christ died for us. Christ died for us. That's the value of a soul. The value of a soul. Now, we reference the story of Luke chapter 12, where this man, this, this farmer, if you will, this man who owned some land and farmed it and had a really good crop. Really good crop with a great year, great harvest. He said, man, I got so much, I don't even know what to do with it. I'm going to tear down my old barns, which aren't big enough, my old silo, which isn't big enough, and I'm going to build bigger ones and pack them full and just pack it full in there and take my ease. Take my ease. Oh, but in uh, verse, what was it? Verse 16 through 20, verse 20, the Bible says, but God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required. Then, then whose things are those going to be? 
that all the things that you labored for and all the barns that you built and the house that you built and the car collection and the stamp collection, the coin collection and the gun collection and, and um, uh, 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 all the goods that you have and your toy collection, all the properties that you have, you're going to die tonight. Then, then who's those, who's, whose things are those going to be? He wasn't calling him a fool because he had stuff. He was calling him a fool because he set his heart on it. Because he said, this is my this is my stamp. This is my staple in life. But God said, so here man says, mankind says, look at me, look what I've done, look what I've achieved. But God says, but God says. So if we're going to get straight on uh, our value system, we have to find balance, balance in life. How is God anti-treasure? No, God is anti-love for treasure. Is God anti-car? No. He's he anti-house? No. Is he anti- no, 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 no. But if we set our affections on those things, then those things get in the way between us and God. Now, balance. Balance in the Christian life. How do I live in a secular world, yet have a spiritual mind and a spiritual outlook and a spiritual demeanor? How do I live in the world and not be of it? Okay, it's balance. A lot of people are shallow and, and somewhat ignorant to think um, balance is partaking of enough of the world, but also taking in enough religi- re- religious religiosity. Religiosity. Boom, I nailed it. Uh, not like this morning, frivolously, for frivolously. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I got it. Um, uh, and they say, well, I can have enough wine if I have enough Bible. I can have enough rock concert if I have enough church. I can have that. Oh, come on. That's like saying I can have a nice dose of arsenic as long as I eat kale. That, that's foolishness. I, I can have enough poison. If I can, if I take enough, if I eat my, if I have my vitamins and I listen to the dead doctors don't lie show and I take the vitamins and, and get enough sunlight and, uh, you know, whatever, drink enough water every day. I get eight out, eight glasses every day. Oh, come on. You can't have enough good, but there is a certain amount of bad that will kill you. Good's not going to kill you. Good, this, the good of God will not kill you. It will not kill you. Um, uh, Pastor um, Alan Domley, in, um, he, we had him preach a couple of times in the past, um, years ago. Uh, he's a pastor in Oklahoma City, and uh, he posted this morning on, a, oh, he, he has a, um, a, a paper or a, a, a Facebook, Old Paths, I think it's called, oh, yeah, Old Paths. He actually has something called the Old Paths Conference, and it's in March, I would really really love to go to that. If I could get out of work somehow or what, I'd love to go. The Old Paths Conference um, in Oklahoma City. And uh, he said this morning, he said, just like enough of the world will, will kill your appetite for God, enough Bible, enough preaching, enough of, of, of godly things will kill your appetite for the world. It'll, it'll say, you know what, I don't, I, um, I've set my eyes, I've set my affections, I've set my sights on something else. I want to find out what's valuable to the Lord, and then I want to set my sights on it and, and pursue it. I want to pursue it. Okay, very quickly, obedience to principle takes time. Number one, obedience to principle takes time. We went over that. Uh, 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 it takes time to learn principles and then to begin to obey them. But number one, obedience to principle takes time. Number two was obedience takes all the time we have. There's never a time where it's okay to become disobedient. There's never a time where it's okay to be like, all right, (laughs) I know the principles, but I'm going to disobey. No, obedience takes all the time you have. As soon as you learn principle, as soon as you learn God's word, as soon as you learn, oh, this is what God wants, be obedient until the the last breath and the last beat of your heart and the last thought of your mind until you slip out into eternity. Let it be a life of obedience to the Lord, a life of obedience. Um, uh, So obedience takes all the time we have. Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20, you say, man, obey all the time, all the time, all the time. Now, 
Has anybody in here, and you don't have to raise your hand, um, uh, but uh, I, I, would, I would venture to say that nobody has been 100% obedient to the Lord in everything that they've always done in the way that the Lord has always come. No, we haven't. The Lord said, soul went in, and you didn't go. The Lord said, go to church, and you didn't go. The Lord said, give, uh, give 10 bucks to missions this week, and you didn't do it. The Lord said, be kind, be forgiving, be loving, go and do and say and think and be, and, and we didn't. It was a hit and miss type of thing, you know? Some and not, and some and not, and some and not. Disobedient and obedient. You say, oh, what's wrong with me? I'll tell you what's wrong with, me, what's wrong with you. The Bible says that foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction driveth it far from him. We immediately say, yeah, kids need spanked. Well, last I checked, we're God's children, aren't we? We don't like to be spanked. I'm I'm 45 years, I'm 35 years old. Nobody spanks me. He does. If you let him, you can run from him. I remember one time, Brother Alex, you never heard this story, but one time my dad was mad, overly mad, more mad than he should have been. And if he was sitting in here tonight, I'd still say what I'm about to say. And he'd shake his head like, no, and it's the doggone truth. Promise, hand, well, I won't do that. Um, but um, I, I promise, there were witnesses. He was more mad than he should have been. And he was going to punish me and my brother Jamal. I wasn't having it. So he said, go up to my office. So we went up to his office, uh, which is my office now, my study. And when you get up to the hallway up there, you have the office to the right, and then you have a room that has an escape door with a fire, fire escape ladder down it and everything. And I looked at Jamal, and I looked at the study, and I looked over there, and Jamal said, no, dude, don't do it. I said, I'm out. <laughs> and I ran from the punishment of my father. I ran, I ran, I ran. I went down to Memorial Park Middle School and I hid in the, in the, um, uh, in the behind a dumpster, you know, and I looked around and da, 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 And I got over to Memorial Park. And there were guys playing basketball. And um, uh, my brother Ben tried to chase me down, his big old clunky feet. I could hear him. He was like 100 yards away. Jake, what'd you think I was gonna do? Stop and go, oh, please don't. No, I ran. And then all of a sudden, I see like the Dukes of Hazard, my father in the truck, driving through Memorial Park, driving over the hills, and the truck's bouncing everywhere. And he pulls up, rolls down the window, and he looks at me and goes, I can't outrun a truck. Like Elijah outran the horses, you know, I couldn't outrun the truck. He, he pulls up and he looks at me and he goes, what are you doing? You are going to beat me for nothing. <laughs> he said, I wasn't going to beat you. I said, yes, you were. <laughs> I wasn't having it. You know, we do the same thing to God. God's like, listen, let, and, and God's not, he, God's never overly mad. God's not, gonna, to, God's not gonna correct you where we don't deserve it. God is a perfect father. God is a patient father, a long-suffering father, and he's not going to correct us more than we deserve. Usually it's not what we do deserve, but he's not going to unjustly punish us. And what do we do? We run from him anyway. We say, no, God, no, and we run from him, and he comes chasing us down in his chariot, and he goes, what are you doing? I'm like, you're going to punish me. Yeah, I was going to correct you. I was just going to sit you up in the office and talk to you. I was, just, You know, God more times wants to convict our heart and, and bring us to tears through conviction and through sorrow and through brokenness than he, do, then he does want to lay us up in a hospital. God doesn't want to lay you up in a hospital. God doesn't want to chop off your foot or make you blind or make you deaf. God doesn't want to paralyze you. God doesn't want to kill you. God doesn't want to hurt you or harm you. God is a loving father who would rather sit you down and say, son or daughter, don't you see? Don't you see what I was trying to do? Don't you see what I was trying to do? You, you hurt me when you do that. And, 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 and you hurt the family when you do that. And, and you hurt the kingdom when you do that. And don't you see? And we go, oh, Father, I'm so sorry. I'm, why? Why? Because foolishness is bound up in our hearts. We, I'm foolish. We've been foolish. I'm still God's child. Oh, I may be an adult, but I'm his child. But God's rod of correction or drive it far from me. Now, you say obey all the time? Yes, here's the reason why, Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I. It's not me, I, yeah, I'm alive, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God, who loved me, 
and gave himself for me. That's why I want to live an obedient life. I want to live an obedient life because Christ died and gave himself for me. Now, last week, uh, last week I gave you this. Life gets out of balance. Life gets out of balance when people spend time chasing things that cannot be obtained. Life gets out of balance when we spend our time chasing things that cannot be obtained. Um, uh, we spend so much time uh, uh, running in circles, a dog trying to chase his tail, uh, walking in circles, going, man, I, I think I've been here before. That's a materialistic lo- mindset. Materialistic mindset, and you'd think we'd learn. Here we are, we worked overtime, and we didn't go to church to get that money so we could go buy that thing, or, or we didn't tie that week so we could glean it and use it for our own lust and coveting to go out and get that thing. And then as soon as we got it, it didn't satisfy that hole in you. It didn't, it didn't fill that void in you. It didn't make that urge go away. You got it, you were so happy to have it. And then a month later, yeah, now we're looking for the new thing. Buyer's remorse. That's why I, I, I have a love-hate relationship with Christmas. I love it because of my Savior. I hate it because of its materialism. Because what do we do? We buy these things for the kids, and then it ends up at the bottom of the toy box. It ends up broken. It ends up, and listen, I, I get it. I, I, I understand. I can play devil's advocate for a minute and go, man, it brought them a month of joy. They had fun. They played with it. They, and what did it cost me? 12 bucks. 15 bucks, 18 bucks. You know, I'm not, I'm not blowing hundreds or thousands of dollars on Christmas. And I, I hope I wouldn't do that if I did, uh, uh, if I did have that kind of money. I, unless it was practical, serious type of gifts that had years in, of longevity in the gifts and whatnot. But this is all these Chinese made garbage. With their, now they're just going to drop it from balloons in the sky. Um, but um, all this Chinese made plastic. Uh, shipped over to America, and uh, we play with it, we break it, we go out and buy something new, we go out and buy something new, we go out and buy something new, and we, we're trying to chase and, and find happiness that cannot be obtained man's way. We cannot obtain real joy and real happiness with man's methods. We, we, it, it's not possible. It's not possible. We, we chase so much the American dream. Uh, folks, I don't want to live a dream. I, I want to live the will of God. I don't want to live a dream. I have hopes. And and I hope and my hope is that if I live for God, He'll give me the desires of my heart. It says that in Psalm 37, 4. Um, uh, what did I just I just preached it a couple weeks ago? Um, uh, why am I miss, why am I drawing a blank here? Delight, thank you. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Delight thyself, thank you, Jamie. She's my walking word of God. Um, uh, uh, (laughs) Delight thyself in the Lord, and my hope is that he'll give give me the desires of my heart. The desires of my heart, you say, well, what if the desires of your heart are wrong? They won't be. Because if you delight yourself in the Lord, God will change your heart. God will give you a new heart. And here's a sure way to always get your will. Everybody, here's, you, I'm going to let you all on a secret. If you want your will, do his will, and you'll always be your will, and you'll always have your will done. Make your will his will. God, I want to see people saved. God, I want the church to grow. God, I want a convert. God, I want to see somebody saved. God, I want somebody to get in that baptistry water because of me. Now, I know, oh, yeah, I know the Holy Spirit and the work of the, I, I get that. But because of my efforts and my work, Lord, I, I, I want the church to grow. Lord, I want blessings. I want the Spirit of God to meet with us on Sunday. That's what I want. God, I want my marriage to blossom and bloom and be happy and wonderful and um, not, not perfect because nobody is. But, Lord, I, I want a godly marriage. And, God, I want to raise godly children. And, and, I wanna, and if my kids ain't, ain't, if my kids aren't godly, then I want them to see mom and dad did their best. Mom and dad were godly enough. And I got no excuse when I stand before God. God, that's why what I want as a father. That's what I want as a mother. That's what I want as a citizen. God, I want America to turn back to you. I promise you, if you'll make God's will, your will, you'll always have your will done always. But if you'll delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. What do we do in America? Man, we just go right after what we want. We just go right after what we want. We say, if we want it, we're going to go out and get it. We'll work, we'll, we'll sell, we'll buy, we'll barter, we'll Craigslist, we'll do anything that we can to get that thing. And it doesn't make us happy. And what does it do? It puts our life out of balance. 
We put so much effort into getting this thing and obtaining this thing that we, in the meantime, we neglect the nuances that make us a Hall of Fame Christian. That's another, uh, another um, a writer, a columnist said about uh, Tom Brady, is he said he, he, or a player, he said he always enjoyed the nuances. Elbow, the exact same height. Release, the exact same place. The steps of the feet, the hips, the, 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 the shoulders, you know, the, the placement of the ball. He said he enjoyed the nuances, the little things, the little things, the little things, the little things. You know what's going to make Three Years Baptist Church great? Keeping the light bulbs changed when they go out. Vacuuming the floor. Fixing things when they're broken. Showing up when the doors are open. Supporting the things that the church is trying to do. The little things. Well, the little things don't matter. The little things are the building blocks that make the great things. That's where it comes from. That's how it starts is the little things. And we can't get our life out of balance. We can't get our life out of balance for so long when I went to, um, uh, I, I went to the gym and I was learning not necessarily power lifting because I would never be in, I was never, my intention is never to go into any competitions to see how strong I am. That's not it at all. It's just all about being healthy and, and it was um, competition for me, mind over the weight, you know, mind over matter and, and, and um, you know, a struggle with the weights. It was always fun. But when I uh, tore my shoulder pulling on uh, some, some uh, a curtain side trailer at work, I pulled, man, didn't feel right. Went and had surgery some time later. Tore my labrum and my rotator cuff, and they cleaned up some some uh, debris that was in there. Um, uh, I went to physical therapy. God bless physical therapy, and I learned a lot of I learned a lot of things that I I didn't really know before. What do we do? You know, guys, we focus on our biceps and our triceps and the show muscles, right? The show muscles. And brother, everybody's like, brother Jake, you don't have those. Uh, yeah, whatever. Um, uh, but uh, the show muscles, that's what everybody capitalized, the show. But the truth of the matter is, is once you, if you start to study anatomy a little bit, you've got to work on this supporting cast. The supporting cast. Oh, listen to that word. Supporting cast. Your chest muscle, your chest muscles. They, if, 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 you know, you build them up, you get strong, but obviously you make, make muscle mass as a fellow. You gain muscle mass, you know, but you know what it's doing? It's pulling on your back muscles, pulling on all the muscles that are in here and your back muscles. And if you don't strengthen the back muscles, it doesn't keep that chest up. It doesn't work. And, and he'd be working on my shoulder and he'd say, Jackson, this is so tight. This should not be this tight. He's, and he would laugh. He'd go, this is this is not good. And he said, what you need to do is you need to work on this. You need to fix this. And I'd go in and see my surgeon and I'd tell him some things that I've learned. And he was always, you know, oh, that's right. his name's uh, Dr. Stephen Wright. Good doctor. He, um, uh, 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 I'd say, so I, I, I kind of get it now. And I'd say, I need to work on the supporting cast before I work on, you know, the gun show, the, uh, the stars, you know, and he, 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 he's like, yes, exactly. You work on the supporting cast and it's the little nuances. It's the little fibers. It's the little muscles. It's the little things that help lay the foundation for the big things. You know, we all look at skyscrapers. We don't go, Oh, I wonder how deep the foundation goes. We don't, we don't, we don't go to the building manager and go, can we check out how far down it goes? No, we don't. We stand out there and go, Whoa, that is huge. The, I still call it the Sears Tower. You can call it the Willis Tower if you want, but it's the Sears Tower to me and always will be. Uh, but I, I, I go down to Chicago and I look at the building and go, whoa. We go down to New York and look at the buildings and go see the skyscrapers, the one in Dubai, you know, and you look at it and you go, oh, goodness gracious, that's incredible. Why? Because of the little things. You have to have that foundation built. You have to have those little things, and we can't have a life out of balance. We can't have a, our life out of balance. We'll be unhappy. We'll be miserable chasing things that we will never, ever, ever obtain. The devil has all kinds of Christians running around and around and around and around and around and around in life, getting us tired, taking our strength, taking our best, and saying, just give God what you have left over on Sunday. Just give God the menial. Just give God the leftovers. We're tired. We're tired, and we're not any further along in the Christian journey, in the Christian life, than we were years ago. So like I said, I don't want to live, in America, uh, live the American dream. I want to live what the will of God for me is, just as unique as my thumbprint is. You can take my phone and 
try to unlock it. Anybody in here can. You may be uh, really smart. You may think all these things. You may be able to do all these things. But the fact of the matter is, if you don't have my thumbprint, you're not unlocking it. And I know there's ways around it. I've watched, you know, spy shows. Uh, uh, you know, if you heat up where the thumbprint goes and then you press on it with a piece of tape, you know what I mean? Okay, whatever. This isn't Hollywood. Um, uh, but um, uh, it's my thumbprint. Mine. You can't get in that. Those are my biometrics. Mine. And just as unique as my bio biometrics and my DNA and my eyeball is, God has a unique specialized, rare will for me that doesn't fit you. And he has one for you that doesn't fit me. Just like I could take your shoe, I could try to force it on my foot all I want. Not gonna fit. Be uncomfortable. And you could take mine, try to put it on your foot. And you could talk yourself into it. I let Lucas wear a pair of my boots the other day. He goes, can I just have these? They fit pretty well. I'm like, no, they stop it. No, they don't. Yeah, they do. My feet are almost, no, stop, son. You know, and all of a sudden I had a vision of him being like that little three-year-old boy running around in daddy's boots and oh, it was so cute. And now I look, I was like, oh, you're wearing daddy's boots again, you know? And he stunk them up, so I let him keep them. Um, but uh, he, 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 as much, and you, you can talk yourself into it. Oh, uh, yeah, I, this, this, pastor, this pastor shoe fits me well, says the guy who wasn't called to be a pastor, and God did not design to be a pastor, and God doesn't want you to be a pastor. And being a pastor is a great thing to be, but it's the, it's the worst thing to be if God's not called you to do it, and God's not designed you to do it, and God doesn't want you to do it, and God's called you somewhere else to do something else, and you're not doing it. Being a pastor is great, and you're like, hey, man, if they're not going to do it, I, I'm going to do it. That's, that's fine. If you got no direction in your life and you don't know where you're going and you don't know what God's calling you to do, then go preach and, and, and go win people to the Lord and go get involved in a ministry and go be a Sunday school teacher and preach night bus and preach teen church and do all those things and, and preach. Preach just means to proclaim anyway. But uh, 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 don't, don't just go... The, the glamour of, oh, I, I want to be a pastor. I want to rub shoulders with, with the pastors and the, the, the special speakers. And No, man, hang all that mess. Better to be in the will of God pushing a vacuum, never talking to the special speaker than it is to be up here sitting with the special speaker and the missionary and the pastor and be out of the will of God. You say, man, that's, a, that's, that's I don't know that I believe that. Well, I do, all day long. It's better to do small in the will of God than it is to do something big out of the will of God all day long and vice versa. If you're supposed to be a pastor, what in the world are you doing with a mop in your hand? You say, pastors aren't supposed to mop a floor? No, come on, you, you know where I'm coming from. I think you understand what I'm saying. What are you doing with a hammer in your hand? You're supposed to be a pastor. You're supposed to be a missionary. You're supposed to be an evangelist. You're supposed to be a Sunday school teacher. You're supposed to be using your talents and your gifts and your abilities for the Lord some way, somehow. What are you doing? I'll tell you what you're doing. You're living out of balance. Not only out of balance, but out of bounds. The devil has us running around, distracted, running away from God. Not doing the will of God. Now, I'll say this. I have... Some to say, but I won't keep you much longer. Don't, don't wait, as I said this morning. Don't wait. Today's the day. But folks, uh, what we need to do is we need to come to terms and accept. We need to accept God's appraisal of the things of life. Things that are important, things that are valuable, and things that are wood, hay, stubble. You say, I never did get that, Brother Jake. What, what's... What? What is gold, silver, precious stone, and wood, hay, stubble? Um, I like the way Brother Bob Gray put it. He said, wood, hay, stubble is the things done on earth for earth. Those, won't, those aren't going to last in heaven. Those will be burnt up. What you did on earth for earth, eh. But what you do on earth for eternity or for heaven is gold, silver, precious stones. Those are the things that will last for eternity. So what does God say last? What does God say? I want to find out what it is. Okay, so that's why we got in the, we, we have to get in the Bible. So folks, don't wait until your dying days. Don't wait until you've 
excuse me, biblical term, put your, pulled your feet or covered your feet in your bed and surrounded yourselves with your loved ones and saying there is a fountain filled with blood and, and drifted out into eternity. Don't wait until your dying days to recognize the things that God said are valuable. Don't wait to say, man, I wish I would have spent time with my family. Man, I would have wish I, I wish I would have I got more familiar with the Bible. I wish I would have reached more in missions. I wish I would have made my life count for something. Don't wait until you're dying to do that. Don't wait until you hear the doctor say uh, you have a, a terminal cancer. Don't wait until that day. Don't wait to, to go home from that that um, uh, uh, the meeting with the doctor and say, man, what am I? What have I done with my life? Have I done anything in my life that has any meaning, anything at all? I, I felt real sorry for a guy, a complete stranger. I pulled in uh, to the uh, gas station parking lot last Sunday morning, and there's a guy just sitting there. I just kind of looked at him, and I said, what, what's that guy doing in life? He's just sitting in his car, scrolling on his phone, kind of a, a clunker of a, of a, of a, a vehicle. He, and then when I came out, there was another guy who came up to, put gas in his car for him, I guess. And I just he's just like looked disheveled, patchy kind of beard, a young younger guy, maybe mid twenties. Uh isn't that weird to say? Uh uh but um a, a guy in his twenties, you know, and, and just kind of disheveled and and kind of grubby looking. And I, I, I please understand I'm not being um I didn't look at him and scoff with a judgmental eye. It was more of an evaluation and more of him being a picture of what, what I was thinking in my head going, man, where's he going in life? What's he doing in life? What's his point and his purpose? What, what's he doing? I'm telling you, you can fold boxes and have God and live a life with purpose. You can drive a truck and do it with God and do it with a purpose. Your life can mean something doing menial work as long as you're a child of God. But you go ahead and build the biggest businesses and the biggest skyscrapers and the most beautiful skylines and be a designer and an architect and, and be in art and um, uh, 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 create music and be a pop star, be a rock star, be at the pinnacle of life without God and you're a nothing, nobody destined for hell. People may remember your name for a while. For a while. All these people next week, they're going to use the word world champions. You're going to go down in the record books for eternity. No, they're not. When God burns up this old world, he's not taking the NFL Hall of Fame with him. God is not salvaging one thing from this earth besides those who have been redeemed. Not one thing. When the God, when God, when it's all said and done, and He speaks the word, and He burns up this old world with a fervent heat, and the devil's in the he in hell forever with His angels and all those who have denied Christ, all those who have said no to Christ, they are set in their eternity, and we are set in our course of eternity. And God makes a new heaven and a new earth, the baseball Hall of Fame and the rock star Hall of Fame and uh, the NFL Hall of Fame and all these Hall of Fames and all these plaques with all these names and all these record books and all these great accomplishments in the man's of eye and the man of eye and the eyes of man are gone forever gone forever you say oh brother jake that puts a damper on things no it puts things in perspective where you say whoa i better get busy doing what matters I better do something that matters with my life. I, I really I really ought to get a grip on this thing and, and get my life in balance, and I want to follow the things of God. I want to follow the things of God. Don't waste your health given it, and, and your wealth giving it to the world. Now, God will take an old beggar back. God will take a sin-riddled body of somebody that comes to the Lord and say, oh God, I wasted my life and I wasted my health. I wasted my wealth. Lord, I wasted my years on the world. Oh God, I'm so sorry. Oh God, would you forgive me? Yes, God will take an old deplorable beggar who's got nothing to offer and, and let them into heaven. Yes, he will. He can take what's broken and fix it. He can take what's sick and heal it. He can take what's shattered and put it back together. He can take what's lost and find it. God can take anything like that and make something out of it. But he's more worthy than giving him what's left over. I want to find balance so I can live full-fledged, pedal to the metal, efficient, fervent, passionate, zealous, on fire for God the rest of my days. 
the rest of my days. Folks, don't wait. Don't wait. Don't do that. If you're healthy, if you're young, if you feel healthy, if you feel young, live for the Lord. Live for the Lord. Start now saying, I want to follow the things of God in my life. That's what I want to follow. We've let this wicked world, we've let the social norms of life appraise the values of life. Oh, that's what kind of car you drive? Oh, you, get, you, you bought your clothes at Walmart? Oh, you're so better because you bought yours at Target? So you, we have the same, let's look on the tag. Oh, it's made of the same stuff and you paid $19 more? Where are the three stooges to slap you and knock you around when you need them? Um, uh, 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 you know, I just, um, uh, you know what? I got this suit for six bucks. Six dollars at Blue Jacket. Uh, we can set you, we can, we can tell him, Brother Jake, you got it for six dollars. Uh, no, I got it for six dollars. Uh, at the same store, I found a three, uh, at least a $3,000 Armani suit for 60 bucks. Like, what? I haven't even worn it yet. It needs to be fitted for all my muscles. Uh, and <laughs> it needs a little bit of tailoring, uh, uh, just a little bit, truly, truly, uh, right arm length and everything, just whoever had it was like 6'8". Uh, but uh, they had long legs and short arms. What a funny-looking individual. Uh, but um, <laughs> but um, uh, uh, nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with shopping on the DL. Ain't nothing wrong with getting a deal. You say the DL, that's the down low, um, uh, the black market, you know. Uh, but um, we've let this world say, what kind of car do you drive? Where do you live? What's your address? What's your zip code? What school did you go to? And you can't help it. We live in a, a, a prejudiced society. We say, oh, equality, <laughs> not equality. You can't get into certain clubs if you don't make a certain amount of money. And that's all for the club. The club wants to do that, you'll go on and do that. I don't want to be in the club. I didn't want to come to this club anyway. I don't want to be a part of this association anyway. I didn't, that's not what I, I want to be on the in cloud. No, 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 no. I don't, do you want to be in my crowd? You say, oh, their crowd. No, what? your crowd. Your crowd. You. Put some value on you. Put some respect on your own name and say, you know what? They don't want me. Their loss. They don't know what they're missing out on. The world wants to tell you what you're worth. I'll tell you right now tonight, the world is wrong. The world is wrong. Always has been. The world is wrong. It always has been and always will be until Jesus Christ is sitting on that throne in the new Jerusalem, ruling and reigning as the, as the light of day that he is. Now we've let social norms reassess our values in life and they are wrong. The world is wrong, social norms are wrong. We've gone through great changes in America. Great changes in America. The value of a child, where we just pervert them now. Pervert them and force absolute filth in front of them. And they used to be the innocence of children. Man, don't talk that way in front of my kids. Don't say that in front of my kids. Don't watch that in front of my kids. What's wrong with you? My kids are a clean slate. They're pure, they're clean, they're holy, they're undefiled. Don't talk that way in front of them. Why? Because innocence. And now, innocence. I, mean, I know eight-year-old kids who, who can sing, um, what's that? Um, she was a, ooh, uh, I'm not going to say it. Um, and I'm not going to say it just for, I, I mean, I, these men on the wall might have said it, but I'm not going to say it. Um, she's, um, she's not a role model and she's not somebody I should be looked up to, Cardi B. She sings filthy, rotten, disgusting, sick, sexual, perverted, rotten, straight out of the pits of hell songs. And there are kids who sit around and sing that stuff and their stinking, foolish, moron parents let them. And I mean saved ones. I see you on Snapchat. I see you on TikTok. I don't have TikTok. Uh, Facebook or whatever it may be. And your little kids shaking their booty. And their little, your little girls dressing like a hoe. You say, oh, Brother Jake, what are you saying? You, parent, you're what's wrong. You're stealing the innocence of a child. Amen. We shouldn't be having it. Boys talking vulgar about women, girls' bodies. Girls, I, mean, I, I, I went down, down yesterday and I heard this girl, a girl. Early 20s, F, 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 B, S, this, G, D, blank, blank, blank. And I thought, goodness gracious, she'd make Brother Pip blush. 
She's a man, she swears worse than a sailor. Goodness gracious, what in the world? That is, that is, wow. Women, ladylike. Ladies, let me tell you. Females, let me tell you, it's not wrong to be a lady. Men, let me tell you something, nothing wrong with being a gentleman. We need some of that old world back. Old world. You say old world? Yeah, old world that had biblical values, biblical basis, biblical balance. Nothing wrong with that at all. Nothing wrong with that, but the world has screwed up the American thinking and churches and pastors and ministries spend so much of their time trying to fix people instead of witness to people because the world has screwed up the minds of America. Man, we're messed up. Most people, they, they don't even know, uh, most people don't even know what kids are for anymore. What are kids for? Kids are to perpetuate a generation and a culture. Kids are there to train and to teach and to carry on a name. We've gone so far in America that children who are not wanted in the womb can be murdered. And I know we've, there's been a lot of um, news on that. Uh, states' rights. Don't want the child, don't want to raise the child, leave it in a dumpster. Put it in a drop box at the fire station. Now, I'd rather you put it in a drop box at a fire station than in a, dum than in a dumpster all day long. We, America can kill the baby. The government and your tax dollars can pay to butcher the baby. Why? Because our values have changed. We're more like the ancient Aztecs who would take babies and throw them in fires and sacrifice them than we are closer to the Lord. Baby sacrifice. Just like Herod going out on a baby murdering spree. Any baby under two years of age, two years of age and under, go out, find them, and kill them. It's always been the innocents suffering the most because of the sins of the adults in the room. If adults, now folks, you and I can't control the White House, Congress, or the Supreme Court, or the Senate, but we can control ourselves. I may not be able to balance the United States budget, but we can balance ours and we can balance ourselves. See, I'm not going to answer for America, but I will answer for, for who I am, where I was, the time I was born. I will answer for me. I will answer. Jake, you were born in America in 1987. You had great opportunities. What'd you do with them? You had the ability to freely spread the gospel. Did you do it? You had the ability and the right and the privilege to go to church openly and to carry your Bible openly and to sing openly and to, to care about people and to love people and to do what's right openly and without real persecution, being murdered or burned at the stake or hung or beheaded or, or thrown into jail or separated from your family, not silenced. They didn't beat you up in the streets. They, all they did was laugh at you. All they did was poke fun at you. All they did was, was, was point their finger at you and, and make fun at you. All they did was laugh at your skirts, ladies. All they did was laugh at your Bibles fellas that's all they did and yet you couldn't stand for me you were born in america and now granted i don't think god's gonna yell at us and speak with us at such passion i don't think it'll be necessary but to know that i'm going to stand before almighty god and i'm going to answer for my life i want to have it lived in balance to say the balance that i found what what balance the balance between good and evil no the balance of being able to stay balanced so i can do consistently right I'm not trying to find balance between good and evil. I'm trying to find my balance in life so I don't fall into the world. So I don't fall down. Just because he said you can fall seven times doesn't mean you have to, to fall seven times. I want to find balance. Balance to stay on that spiritual bike, that spiritual road to say, okay, if obedience takes all my time, then I want to spend less time falling down. The more time I spend falling down and the time it takes me to get myself back up is time wasted not being obedient, which means blessings lost, people not saved, converts not on the pew, baptisms not, the baptismal water's not stirred, buses not running, school not going, 
conferences not being attended to, hearts not being stirred, conviction not being preached. If I spend more of my time praying for forgiveness because I've fallen down and, and I didn't want to get up and times I want to quit, and, oh, dear God, and I spend more time doing that, that's less time I spend praying for you. That's less time I spend knocking doors. That's less time I spent. Why? Because I've been living out of balance. I don't want to live out of balance. So, my children are not mine. They're God's. God didn't say, find good cartoons and let them rear your children. God didn't say, give your children to, your grand, to their grandparents because you need to go maintain a healthy American lifestyle. God did not say, um, uh, 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 in any ways compromised with the world. He said, Jake, Jamie, Christians, people of God, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he, was not, he will not depart from it. I'm supposed to raise my children the way the Lord wants me to raise my children. Uh, one of the things that, that, that just, God, man, they get me, they drive me crazy about being in the truck is that, man, I want to be there for my boys. I want to be there for my boys. Like, I think more than my kids need school, they need dad. Because dad can school them. Uh, uh, more, than, more than my kids need anything, they need dad. And I tell that to my, my dad all the time. I tell that to my father. I say, Father, my sons need their father. Dear God, I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what's happening. But Lord, you've got to do something special while I'm out on the road for my kids. You've got to let, you got to let uh, uh, manly influences be in their life. You got to let Grandpa Jackson and Grandpa Bob and, 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 and Brother Kevin and Brother Pip and, well, I don't know about Uncle Dan. Uh, uh, <laughs> and, 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 and others, Lord, you got to let these men have an influence in my sons. Oh, God, help my sons. Oh, God, keep my sons. Oh, God, rear my sons. Oh, God, help my sons. But God, more than anything, get me home so I can be there with my sons because I want to be there for them. I want to be there for them. Not cartoons, nothing like that. There was a day when young boys wanted to be um, uh, 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 soldiers and servants for the American public. Now everybody wants to be a TikTok star and an Instagram star and an NBA star and an influencer. Hey, look, I can sit around and open gifts all day and 15 million people watch it. Folks, I'm all for easy money. But America is not going to survive because of Instagram influencers. America is going to be destroyed because of Instagram influencers. They're not do, there's no innovation. There's no industry. They're not doing anything to promote good, sustainable uh, uh, work and um, uh, uh, longevity in, uh, in the American public. I'm not bashing on Instagram influencers. What I'm saying is, is they're not bringing anything to the table. They are there for the entertainment factor. You know who used to be there for the entertainment factor? The court jester. He came in before the king. He did some tricks. He juggled. He blew fire out of his mouth. He, he did the magic show. Folks, you know what's going to happen to a country when everybody wants to be a magician? Poof, we're gone. Everybody wants to entertain. Easy money. The Bible says that in all labor there is profit. Work. 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 God told uh, uh, Adam when he cast him out of the garden, he said, by the, the sweat of your brow, the toil, you're going to till the ground. You are going to work. You're going to work. He didn't say you're going to sit around and write poetry. And I'm all for poetry. There's been great poetry. Poetry to stir the heart. But you're going to work. What builds a world, what builds a man, what builds a country are, are his intellect and his hands. Now, you say, you sound jealous. Folks, I'm, I'd love to make easy money. I'd like to, the easiest money I'd like to make is going, oh, look, money. Pick it up. I'd like to make money that way. But the world of industry, the world does not turn on entertainment. It turns on the people behind the scenes, behind it, pulling the curtains and setting up the props and, and, and raking the fields and cutting the grass and putting on roofs and building the buildings and, and, and busting down the old ones and putting up new. Men wanted to be servants. Kids wanted to be servants. They wanted to be, I want to be a president. 
I want to be a humanitarian. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a soldier. We saw some of that. I remember uh, our country being awakened a little bit uh, as a teenager. I saw that in September of, ni- of 2001. I don't think our country has... That's the only time I've ever experienced our country coming together the way it did. If you can go back in your mind and and think about that for a minute, how we came together, we had a common enemy, (laughs) common hatred, (laughs) though it was some of it was misplaced. But the country just, man, we banded together. People wanted to serve. They wanted to help. People flocked to that to help. The Boston bombing, the Boston Marathon bombing. People showed up to help, and and we still have that. But little by little by little, that's being chipped away out, being taken away. Why? Because values have changed. Values have changed. Values have changed. But I'm done with this. What hasn't changed? What hasn't? The Word of God. The Word of God hasn't changed. We sing it. All may change, but Jesus never. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. All may change, but Jesus never. Glory to his name. The word of God hasn't changed. Now, how cool is that? Your health has changed. Your world has changed. Brother Hoffman, we just mentioned that after church this morning about the world changing, the country changing, kids changing. But the values of this book have not changed. And if you don't want to, if you want to stem the tide, then attach yourself to this book. Learn it. Love it, live it, and you won't change. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this evening. I thank you that your word has not changed. I love how you said you would magnify your word above your name. Your word. Truly, Lord, your word is your bond. I don't know that it can be said about anybody. Man man has good intentions, but man fails. But, Lord, you will never fail, never have, never will. Lord, thank you for an unchanging word. I'd ask that you'd help us to maybe clean the slate tonight or clean out the closet or the attic, so to speak, and kind of go into our value system and say, I've placed value on this, and this has no real value, no everlasting value, um, and to replace it with a biblical value. Uh, so we can live a life that's in, in, in balance, uh, a life that is pleasing to you, not one that's too, um, too hot, or too cold, and definitely not one that's lukewarm. I should say, Lord, we, we should burn hot. We should be on fire. Lord, we don't want to be cold. We don't want to be lukewarm. But, Lord, there are many days where we're hot and we're cold, and, and, and in the middle of the week, we're lukewarm, and then by Saturday or Sunday, we're hot, and then by Monday, we're cold. Lord, uh, find balance so we can be consistent, consistent, consistent. With consistency comes greatness. Heavenly Father, help us to run the race that is set before us, but to run it and find the pace that we can consistently continue to run. Heavenly Father, I'd ask that you'd bless us along our way as we travel and go to and fro. Uh, Scripture says that when we get up and when we sit down, when we go out, when we come in, Lord, you know every time we move. Lord, guide our steps. Keep us safe. Help us to avoid temptation. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Miss Jennifer, you can hit it.